Ahead of Sunday's visit to Old Trafford, we've been along to catch up with a man who lays claim to being the only man to ever captain both Liverpool and Manchester United, Paul Lins. We caught up with him down in London to talk through his decision to switch into Milan for Anfield, having of course spent six years at United, as well as his thoughts on the situation of both sides in the modern day. Plus, he tells us whether he thinks this year could be the year that Liverpool lift a league title. I think I've had some good and bad memories, to be fair. I think, I think to be fair, I think um, I've always I've been fortunate I've scored against both teams. I uh, remember playing at um, Old Trafford against, from 89 against Liverpool, uh, beating 1 0. Um, corner kick, Dave James in goal was a mate of mine, so got up and rose and flicked it in the back of the net. 1 uh, 1 0. Um, and then I remember the game when I obviously came back from Inter Milan, uh, played mate night in the FA Cup at um, Anfield. 2 1 down. I think Dennis Irwin got set off for kicking the ball away. Um, it was funny though because. We, and then, we went down the other end and then the ball kind of broke to me in the, at, the, at the Anfield end, the cop. I mean, when you play for Liverpool, you always want to score at the cop. You know, it's, just, it's like a dream, isn't it? you know, to score at the cop. And it came to me and it just put it in the back of the net and I went absolutely mad, started kicking all the ball in and I drew 2 2. And I was like absolutely buzzing. And then I just realised when I got the change room that we had to go, <laughs> had to go back to Old Trafford for the replay and I knew I was going to get some sticks. So <laughs> it was a bit bittersweet, you know. and. Um, um, and also, I think the, probably the biggest game that stands out for me is the 3-3 uh, the at Anfield. Um, got off to a flyer. Um, I think who scored first? I can't remember who scored first. I think Giggs, I'm not sure Giggs has scored. Um, anyway, we scored first anyway, and then Giggs chipped the keeper, Bruce, and then Dennis Sermon whipped in a free kick into the top-hand corner, and we were 3-0 up. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, can't get any better than this. And then Nigel Clough scored, and he scored again. And then I remember they had a corner kick from the left hand side, not, not in the cup, in at the other end. And um, I can't remember who took it. And I was, it's one of those things I was jumping to get it. And you know, you're just trying to stretch your neck. And you just, I just couldn't get it. It just kind of went right over my head. And I remember Neil Ruddock come running in and smash it in to make it 3 3. Uh, it was one of, it was probably the best game that I've ever been part of, Liverpool Mate United, because. We absolutely had so many chances. It could, it could have been it could have been about 12-5 to United. We had chances, chances galore, chances galore. But from a game point of view, from a big game point of view, and as you said, when you when you look at Mate Night Liverpool, it's always a giant game because it's Mate Night Liverpool because of the rivalry that. Do you want to shut this window? Or is that too loud? Is that right for you or not? Uh, it's, it's all right. Okay, okay, fine. fine. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> When you when you when you um, <clears throat> look at the mate night Liverpool games because of the rivalry from the 80s 90s, obviously those two teams winning most things, uh, it was always a massive massive game, um, and there's always kind of battles all over the park because um, there were so many top players. So, but that game in itself is probably the best game that I've ever been party to. Um, um, in that game, it's a shame we didn't win it, but it was it was a great great game, and uh, it's funny now because nowadays when you kind of look at the game on Sunday and you think. It's a giant of a game. Well, it, it's, it, for me, it, it is by names. It is by history. It's, it's not actually by. Um, if I was to say to you now, right, pick out the battles in the park, the best. You know, you don't really get them anymore because the players are not like that anymore. It wasn't like you had like Keane and me and Gerard and you know people like Patrick Vieira and Petit. There was battles in all those games. You know. Um, these games don't really do that. I mean, the amount of times I've seen United Liverpool games, you know, even last year at Old Trafford, um, which was nil-nil, it was just it was boring. You know, the free one at Anfield where Liverpool, well, Mourinho parked the bus really, didn't he? Um, so they're not they're not the, the games that you, you expect to do when you look at those two teams because now they're in Sunday's game is completely different from a different point of view. It's more an interest to see how United are going to cope with Liverpool because Liverpool are the best team and. I think when I played for Mate United, we always expected to beat Liverpool because we're the best team. And I think when I played for Liverpool, we expected to lose to Mate United because they had probably the best team. Um, this is probably a, a time now where everyone expects Liverpool to win because Liverpool are the, are the, are the best team. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens on Sunday. It was quite strange, really, because obviously I'd, um, I don't think I, I could have gone. Because when you do cr go across the divide, I don't think I could have gone from Manchester United straight to Liverpool. Because no, people don't do that. 
I know Michael Owen went from Liverpool to Mate United, but I don't think anyone else has actually done it, to be fair. Um, so whether I could have gone from Mate United to Liverpool, I'm not too sure. Um, the fact that I went to Italy for two years, um, and I would have stayed longer, um, I had a five-year contract. Um, and then after two years, it was a bit of a struggle for the wife. Thomas was only five, the eldest one. Um, and the language was a bit of a problem. Not for me, I was speaking fluent Italian, so it was right for me. But just for settling, because when you play for Inter or when you play for Italian teams, they own you lock, stock and barrel. Yeah. So <clears throat> you, you need training ground, you stay in the training ground, you go to fans, forums, and so they kind of, oh, you're always away from home. And then I think after year two, um, Claire said, Claire, I think my wife caught Bell's palsy, and I was away in um, training with Inter. And I didn't, they didn't really do enough to help her. So she ended up being a club doctor, a solid England doctor, because we was playing international week the week after. And he got on a plane straight into the hospital, and, and she was pregnant at the time. Uh, my second son, Daniel. And so after that, she kind of lost kind of the love for it. You know what I mean? We went back, and then she said to me, oh, you know, I want to go back home. So I was like, Jesus. Because <laughs> I was having a whale at the time, you know what I mean? I was loving it. You know, I was, I was playing, the fans were, fans were loving me. The owner <clears throat> adored me, Massimo Marati. Um, even when I was crapping games, you know, I mean, I was, the fans thought I was good. You know, the food was great. The, everything about Italy was fantastic. We just signed um, Ronaldo for the next season. So I'm thinking, wow, well, Ronaldo, I've got to play Ronaldo. So that's, that's where I was, you know, that's where I was. Um, so then I, I said to Claire, listen, I'm going to have to speak to the, the owner, Massimo Marotti. He was devastated, tried everything, every, everything to keep me, to give me a 10-year contract. And anything I wanted, I could have got. But it was more of a family decision. Um, so I spoke to my agent, um, Steve Cutton, I said, listen, I'm, can I have Claire wants to come back? Um, just see what's, what's out there, you know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't make my mind out for sure. Um, and then with about a week, I got a phone call from um, Reid Hullet, to me come to Chelsea. Um, I didn't want to go back to London, because I'd spent like six great years at United up in the north, and I kind of felt you know, it was a bit more quiet than London and it was a nice place to bring my kids up. Um, and then I got a phone call about two days later from Peter Robertson, who was the chairman of the time at, um, at Liverpool. Uh, and he said, no, listen, I'm a spoke to Steve. There's um, an interest that you might come back. I said, yeah, I'm thinking about it. Explain the reasons why I was thinking about it. I said, not made a decision yet. He said, well, can I jump on the plane and see you? So within the day, he was sitting in my apartment, talking to the restaurant, we chat, we spoke. Um, and after that, I said, right, that's the club for me, you know, because it wasn't just a fact <clears throat> uh, it was Liverpool, it was a fact that I knew most of the players there, so it would have been easy for me to settle in. You know, John Barnes was there, Mickey T was there, you know, Macca, people that I've been at England with, uh, you know, Robbie, so David James. So it wasn't hard for me to settle in, so that, that was probably the reason why, you know, I went to Liverpool. And I never actually thought about the divide, you know, I never thought about, well, because I'd gone to Inter first, it, 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 I, it was one of them, I, you know, mate, no, I had, had, had first option on me to come back, and they could have took it up and they didn't, you know. Not to say I would have gone to Manchester United, because you never go back a second time, but I just felt Liverpool were a club where they had some very, very exciting players, you know, you had Michael Owen coming through as a young kid, um, and I just felt they needed to something different, that kind of changing attitude and changing mindset, you know, because they hadn't won for anything for years, you know what I mean? And they wanted to win a title and I just felt they needed someone who'd been there, done it, let them know what it takes to win a title and how you've got to kind of present yourself, you know, what you've got to do in training, you know, that, that type of stuff that you've got to do to, if you want to be a winner, but you all got to do it, you're kind of just half doing it. So I thought it was kind of a, um, a project for me to go and try and do that and change the way the Liverpool players were thinking because I just felt they were good players, but they just want so half of them just wanted to go out all the time, and you know, I just thought that that wasn't the way. I don't want players going out because we went out at Manchester United and Inter, but I just felt they needed that professional on, on the pitch where they did everything right. You know what I mean? Wanted to improve themselves, get themselves better. Um, so it, it was probably the right move for me to do because it's quite exciting, and I kind of felt that the Liverpool fans are all great football fans. They're not just, you know, I thought they knew they understood football. They're great people, Liverpool are great people anyway, you know, just in general. They're always happy, always bubbly, and I just felt if anyone was going to accept me, it would have been the Liverpool fans, you know. 
Um, and so all, all the boxes were kind of ticked to go to Liverpool, to be honest. Because I kind of felt that we had the team. Um, I mean, no disrespect, I felt we finished third and fourth in the two years. I think if I'm right, I might be wrong. And that would have been really equivalent to Champions League now. You know, it was something that wasn't around at the time. Um, and yeah, it did, because I think under Roy Evans, I think we, we had someone who was, I thought was perfect for the club. I thought um, when Hule came in and they worked together, it never really could work because we didn't know who exactly was the manager. Um, but I also felt that we had, <coughs> excuse me, a, a very talented team. You know, I didn't think, when I look at my team now, it was me and Jamie Redknapp in midfield, Patrick Berger, Mac Manaman, I think we scored the most goals in that league, the four of us, in, the, in those roles. And then we've got Michael we've up front, Robbie Fowler, then Riedler. So we had some top, top players. I think at the back, we never got it right. You know, I think if I look at the team, Liverpool team now, and I think if we had that back five, you know, we would have won the title after title after title. Because I think the rest of the team was, was pretty much in order, you know. Um, so that, that kind of um, wrangles with me a bit, you know. And also the fact that, you know, I was there for two years, I should have been there longer. You know, I think Hulé took over and then I found out he was trying to sell, sign Mark, Mark Vivian Foe. He passed away, obviously, so uh, behind me back and w wasn't happy with that, you know. So when I went in to see him in pre-season, he was saying, yeah, well, we'll try to sign him in, but it's, it's not to replace you. And I said, well, you should have let me know. I'm the captain of the club. You've got to do things a bit better than that. And I just kind of didn't feel it was right to be there, you know. And that's why I left. But, you know, I didn't want to leave. You know, that's the last one, you know, I was living in in the wheels, so I was happy, you know, my kids were at school, didn't want to leave. Um, but I just felt that the way it was done behind my back that, you know, I had no choice. I think it shows you, um, you know, in the seven years since 2013, since he's left, how special he was and how great he was and how he was great at building teams but still winning things at the same time. Not necessarily titles, but you know, even when we went in there in 89, we finished 12th in the league, I think, something like that, but we still won the FA Cup. And the year, before, the year after that, we finished about 8th, but won the Cup Winners' Cup against Barca. And I think that was a turning point for us. And I hope it's going to be the same for Liverpool this year. Uh, once we realised we could beat Barca, the next year in training from pre-season, it was just a different mindset, a different belief, you know, that we can go and win the title. And I think that's hopefully with the same in Liverpool. Um, but I think in the last seven years, you, you're always trying to find that Sir Alex Ferguson. You're always trying to find that formula that can build Mate United again. And we tried it with Moyes. Moyes didn't have enough time, to be fair, if I'm being completely honest. Um, Van Gaal was probably never the right one because he was too much of a disciplinarian. You know, the players would never get on with him. Um, and Mourinho, to be fair, when you look at what he's done, won the FA Cup, you know, finished second, that looks quite good now, didn't it? Finishing second, you know, winning the Europa League and getting into the Champions League. It was a successful time, but there was something off the pitch that we weren't seeing. The players didn't look happy. Even when they were playing on the pitch, I mean, you're playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world. You know, I should be smiling, but, you know, when Martial scored, he just like, oh, I've scored, or they just didn't look happy, the whole team, and, um, you know, something was completely wrong. You know, Mourinho didn't move up there, he stayed in the hotel, he didn't take his fault there. You know, then he started having a go at the press and it was the press against him. And then all the stuff that was coming out of Old Trafford that would never come out with under Sir Alex. It was always kept in-house. You know, and, and I think, you know, all, all the dirty laundry was getting aired out in public and then the issue with him and Pogba that kept going on and going on. It, it didn't seem right. There was issues there you know, that we, weren't, we, that we were aware of that shouldn't be coming out of such a big club or such a great club. Um, so it it, 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 at the end of it, it was, was going to see its time, you know, and you know, it wasn't surprised when he left. Um, but you can't keep chopping and changing managers, you know, and that's what's so great about Liverpool with Klopp, you know what I mean? They've given time four or five years to build a team. Pep Guardiola, four or five years to build a team. Are they going to give that to Schalsker? I don't know. I, I really don't know. And, um, because what we've seen in United, we haven't seen any progression under Schalsker. We saw it for the first 10 games, but admittedly, they, the fixture list was quite kind to him. You know, apart from the Tottenham game where they won 1-0, but Tottenham should have won by five or six if it wasn't for the goalkeeper, Gay. Um, we haven't seen any progression. And I said, this year, you want to hit the ground running. And you thought Chelsea 4-0 at home, you thought, here we go. And then, since that, it's just gone, it's gone flat. It's gone really, really flat. And, you look at the way they're playing, 
you know, and people say, yeah, they're a young team, and it's, but so are Chelsea. But this make up fans understand where they are as a team, and they can accept to a certain degree the results. Um, but you need to see progress on the pitch. And, you know, we go, they are a young team, um, but Chelsea are a young team. You know, and they're scored and creating goals. I beat Southampton 4 1. So you can see where they're going, which is exciting. At the moment, you can't see where they're going. And this, and this is kind of what divides the fans, you know, because initially at the start, <coughs> excuse me, everyone was saying, yep, yeah, 10 games, give Ollie the job. And I was like, mm, no, let's just wait. You know what I mean? He's an interim manager, there's no rush. Let's wait till the end of the season, do your research and see who else is out there. And if you go for Ollie, then great, that's the decision you make. But to kind of jump into it straight away because of the start that he had against, no disrespect, they weren't the biggest teams in Cardiff and Huddersfield and teams like that. Uh, no disrespect to those teams. Um, you know, I was, I was a little bit too soon. Um, and I said, you know, you know he, has to, he has to hit the ground running. And, you know, he fought against Chelsea, that was going to be the case. Um, but it was disturbing because after the Newcastle game, which kind of disturbed me when David De Gea did his interview, and you know, he's meant to be, I mean, he's been here 10 years now or something like that, he's meant to be one of the leaders of the team. You know, he's seen the players come and go and he's seen what goes on at the training ground. And he, he didn't have any answers. You know, it was just like, I don't know, I don't know. And it, it, it said to everyone, what is going on? You know, if that had been Peter Schmeichel or something, they'd have gone, right, we need to be doing this. That's not right, we need to change this. You have answers. And I think when... You look at the two interviews with Ollie and David, yeah, there was no answers. We kind of would, even limbo, didn't know what, you know, he kept saying we need to work harder, need to work harder. But what, on what? Because we're not seeing what you're working harder on. Um, so everyone's kind of up in the air, you know, we don't know where mate and they are. And, you know, you kind of feel that, I wouldn't say Sunday's a massive game for Ollie. You know, you know I've got a lot of mate and friends and I've got a lot of Liverpool friends, you know, fans, I should say. Um, and the mate and fans are, oh, I hope we don't get one up four or five. You know, and Liverpool fans are like, yeah, we're going to beat them four or five. So you can see how the, the mindset have changed. I think, you know, mate night fans, or the ones that I know, if we get beat 2-1, or two, that's respectable for, because of the way Liverpool, where Liverpool are and where Mate United are. Um, and so Ollie won't be judged on Sunday's game, whether they get beat or not. Um, but there's games after that where they go to Norwich, they've got Sheffield United. You know, they're the games that you expect them to win because I, 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 don't, really, I don't care whether it's a young team on an old team, you know, if you're going to have to play for Mate United, you've still got to be getting results and you've still got to be beating the likes of Sheffield United and, and Norwich. And if you don't, then that's just going to hit more pressure on you. Um, so, you know, going back to that, I, I still feel they, they made their decision too hasty, but they've made it now. And then, then they need to come up and say what the plan is. Has he got the next three transfer windows so he can build a team because this is what they're saying, you know? Or has he not? And I think the next two or three results would, or games will tell us that. I, was like, I, I wouldn't say dominate, I think dominate's the wrong word um, because you can never dominate when you've got teams like City, you know, <laughs> chasing. But, you know, you kind of think what Liverpool did last year, you know, to lose one game in the Premier League and, and not win it um, but was, was, was ridiculous. It was amazing, but, you know, it just shows the quality of City and the quality of those two teams. But what it shows me now is that after beating Tottenham in the Champions League, there's... I think the combination of that and obviously just losing out to City last year, last game of the season, I think that's given a greater belief to believe that they can go and win it this year. Um, and they've started, off, they've started off that way, haven't they? They really have. I mean, the record keep winning games and is, is phenomenal. And you have to grow into these situations. You have to learn from your experiences. You're good and you're bad. And that's what we did at United. You know, we, we learned from our experiences. Um, we became stronger and stronger each season. And that's why we start to dominate 92, 93, 94, doubles and that, because we learnt. But what we also did, we had the right personnel to come in behind us when we were gone. Something Mate United haven't got. You know, when I, when I went to Manchester United, I had Ryan Robson, my idol, you know what I mean, to learn from. Steve Bruce, Mark Hughes. You know, when they left, and Giggsy and Beckham and Scalzi came in, they had me and Keeney and people like that to learn from. Now, but these kids haven't got that, you know, they haven't got those leading characters. But when I look at Liverpool, I see leaders, I see characters, I see Henderson, even, you know, Van Dijk's coming, great by, best centre-half in the world for me. But not just from a player, but the leaders, 
you know, even Robertson, you see him having a go at people, pulling people around, you know what I mean? You should be here, you should be here. You don't see that at Mate United. When they go a goal down, everyone's just left to, the, to their own devices, and these are young kids, so it's not their fault. Um, so you can see the difference between the two teams, and I think this is something that I've been seeing in the last two years from Klopp. You know, the way he's built the teams, the way he's made a couple of mistakes, but then he's brought in the right players, he's brought in Ronaldo, he's brought in Fabinho. You know, Cage has not really played a lot this year. You know, that's probably one that he's not too sure about, that's why he's not played a lot. Um, but it's, for me, it's just the complete team from back to front now. Van Dijk was massive. Um, Matip just come in, he's still got Gomez to come back. You know, so it's not just the fact that he's got a good, a great eleven. he's also got people who can come in and do exactly the same jobs as, as a midfielder, you know what I mean? Henderson doesn't play all the time, you know? So he's got it right, he's got it, got it right. And I, I, I just think the way they keep winning games and not necessarily playing well all the time, even last year, those games where they didn't play well and got a point or something like that, even the Leicester game, they scored a penalty in the last, the last minute, you know? And you kind of think things are happening for them, you know? I thought last year things were going to happen. There's, there's a time in the league where you think you're getting decisions that kind of benefit you all the time and you think it must be our year. You know, I mean, I saw that a lot with Liverpool last year, even at West Ham with the goal that Liverpool scored was offside. And, you know, things like that, and you think that's their year. And then to lose it like they did must have been soul-destroying. But to have the character and belief this year to keep going back from where they left from and hit the ground running, that's the word that I use, hit the ground running. And they've done it week in and week out. They may not have done it for one game against Chelsea. That was it. Liverpool keep doing it and keep doing it. Uh, and they've got the right manager. They've got the right manager in, 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 in control. Um, you won't let them get away with an inch. He's always barking orders, the passion, the players love him. They want to work hard for him. Um, and if he doesn't like something, you tell him. You know? and, and that's the son of a good player because you get a reaction. When you tell a good player something, you get a reaction. And that's what you see at Liverpool. So they've got a nice little head start, eight points. I think they've revved that later on in the season. Um, but I, I truly believe this year, I always felt last year that Manchester City would win it. I said that. Uh, but this year, I, I, kind of, I truly believe Liverpool will win it. Well, that's, 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 why, that's why you bring in the, the certain characters. You know, and, and I keep reverting back to Manchester United, and I shouldn't do really. Um, but it's like there was talk about Slatan coming back to Manchester United. You know, one is a prolific goal scorer, but two, he marshals the changing room. You know, that's this what they need, they need someone to control the change. So when you look at Liverpool, you can imagine when Klopp's not there, the likes of Henderson, the likes of Van Dijk, you know, those, those, those type of people, um, they, they run it themselves. That's the, the, to be a successful team, you, sh you shouldn't have to rely on the manager to run the changing room. That's down to your leaders, it's down to your captains, your vice captains, you know, to make sure everyone's in line and no one's getting carried away and no one's talking about winning titles and winning this. You know, and Liverpool have got that. They've got that in, in, in abundance, and um, that's the good thing about it. You know, really, it's really it's so, it's so important because you, you know there's going to be times, bumpy times. You know, where you you're not going to be confident, as we said at United. And you need someone to make sure that you're all singing from the home sheet, same hymn sheet. You're not slaughtering this player. You're not slaughtering the manager. You're not, you know, it's down to that. That's your change room. That's where you look after. And if you've got the right people in there, then you'll be okay. Well, I think, yeah, and I think when you kind of look at it, I think they thought uh, Nebby Kate was going to be the one, didn't they? And, you know, you kind of think when F F Fabinho came into Liverpool, it was like, well, he doesn't know what the expectations are from these teammates and then from Klopp, and that's why we, we're going to leave him out for a period of time, which they did. He came and played 10 minutes. But, you know, once he grasped it, you know, because, listen, he was at Monaco, you know, he played centre half there, and so it's hard to make that transition. Um, but once he's grasped it, he's a perfect build, isn't he? You know, he's strong, he can pass. I like to see him get a bit forward a bit more. I think, I think this is the thing, I think, when you kind of talk about the modern game, you kind of have a designated position. People talk about numbers, he's a four, he's a six, he's, a, he's an eight. Never did that at United, at Liverpool. You know what I mean, I, I was probably the more holding one because the likes of Keeney and Redknapp, they, they wanted to get forward. But I think as a holding midfield player, you still have to pick your times when you go into the box. Six foot two, six foot three, Fabinho. You know, he's, as much as he sits there, Fergie also, Fergie, Fergie also say to me, every first half, get yourself in the box two times. Just say to King, you sit, I'm going to go. Cause it stops, it stops. If you think I'm going to sit there all the time, it's an easy job for you. One minute you turn around and I'm gone in the box and I score, that's your man. 
So that's something Fabinho's got to learn to his game. That's something like Declan Rice has got to learn to the game. Because you're just a sitting doesn't mean you've got to sit all the time. You use your attributes and get yourself in the box. Not all the time, but you can do it because you'll always have Henderson will sit there for you and so have an Adam. So, but as far as coming in and doing a job, we always worried about him at the start because he wasn't playing. But now you, you, you can see he's so integral to what Liverpool do and he understands what Klopp wants, how the team plays. And, and you know, we always talk about the top three, you know, Firmino and Salah and Arnie, but, you know, you've got Fernaldum and Henderson and Fabinho, they've been outstanding. I think that you're Liverpool are fortunate in the fact that you've just got those three up top who will score your goals, you know, 20 goals a season. You know, and there again, it's, it's, you know what's funny? Every time I speak about Liverpool, it always makes me think about Mate United. You know, because we talk about goal scorers, you know, you talk about Salah, 20 odd goals, Sarni, uh, Manish, 20 odd goals. You know, Rashford got 11 goals last year in the Premier League, the highest. You know, Liverpool ain't, mate, like that ain't scoring any goals, haven't got a centre forward. You know, all the best teams have got people who score 20 goals a season. So when you look at the Liverpool front three, it's a case of, right, let them get on with it. You know, we're just sitting behind. You might get a, an Aldum who, who scores some goals. I mean, he's got scored two, two in the week against, yeah. you know, two very good goals. Um, or you might get a Henderson who might pop up like he did last year at, at Southampton, making that long busting run. Um, but no, mainly it's like, because you've got the full-backs bombing in and all, it's like five, defend with five, so it, it works, it works. But you're right, you know, sometimes you need the midfielders to get in the box and score goals. Um, and knowing Liverpool, it probably be right at the end of the season when I need to win a title where Fabinho might pop up or Henderson might pop up to win a title. It's that kind of way. But yeah, I think when you're scoring goals and you're playing the way Liverpool are playing, and, you know, they're, they're just a joy to watch, you know what I mean? They really are. And the consistency levels and the fact for me is that this Liverpool team very rarely never get injured. You look at the injuries that make United have time and time again. Shaw, Jones, Lingard, Martial. They're not just out for one week, they're out for four or five weeks. So there's an issue, there's an issue there with whatever they're doing at Manchester from a medical point of view, not just a recruitment point of view. But the way Liverpool play and they like the way Klopp wants them to play to press high and the fullbacks keep bombing on, you know, they're fit every week. The front three are fit every week. So that's got to be a credit. People don't look at that. You know, every week those front three play or the midfield play might chop one or two, but they're fit every week. And that's, that's, you've got to have that if you're going to win the title. Because if you go away from that, you might have Shaqiri, who probably not had the chances that he should have had. Um, Origi is an impact player for me. But those three, three fit have to stay fit, and they've done it all the time. So if that's the case, they, they're going to win the title for me. Well, I kind of look at it one or two ways. I think because Alisson's not played all season. So, if I was going to pick, if you said to me, pick a combined team on form on their day, on their day, okay? Because you can say a certain player and say, well, he's not played well this season yet, but on his day, if he plays to how he should be playing, who would get into a combined team? Then I think you'd have a, a debate between Alisson and David Aguirre. I think you would. Um, I think for me, I think the two full-backs speak for themselves, Ben Arnold and Robinson. Um, for me, I'd go with Van Dijk, who's the best defender in the world, alongside Maguire. I think that. I think you'd probably go Ronaldo, you'd go Pogba, and you'd go either Fabinho or Henderson. But you'd definitely go Pogba in there, that's for sure. Um, and up three, you've got the Liverpool front three. And maybe Rashford on his day could probably come in for Firmino or something like that. You know, uh, that would be me looking at it now. If I look back at it 15, 20 years ago, we'd be sat in a pub all day, all night, debating. You know what I mean? Which, which one you want? No, would you have Giggs, would you have Chelsea, would you have McManaman, would you have Fowler? You know, it'd be a debate for a long time. This is where we are now. It's not even, it's not even a debate. You now we're trying to think, well, which players could get in now? I've just named four. You know, that might, I mean, for me, two guaranteed would be uh, Maguire and Pogba. But then again, you're saying the other two, maybe. That can't be right, because normally in the Mate United team, Liverpool team, you'll have four or five, six Mate Uniteds and five Liverpool would be pretty close. This is where Mate United at this moment, and this is where Liverpool are at this moment. I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of glad you said that, because I kind of felt last year, they weren't to a certain degree. And I can understand why, because they haven't won it since 1990. 
and there's such this, you know, they've gone through the, the Brendan Rodgers when they should have won it. Um, and they're so, they want it that bad. It's like the holy grail to Liverpool fans at the moment. Um, and I thought last year, maybe subconsciously, I don't know, but you can sit, sense the nerves in the stadium. You really, really could have, when they drew against uh, Leicester last year, you can sense it, you know what I mean, when the pitch was, well, so-called a bit slow and all that stuff. And that, you know, Klopp was making excuses and you can't make excuses, you know, it's the same for both teams. So you could sense the nervousness in the stadium. Um, I think if they can conduct themselves in a different way this year, um, then I think they can be the 12th man. I really think they can. They normally are. They normally are. But I think because I live in the Wirral and I live around Liverpool fans, um, they like that. You can still sense when I talk to them, they're still kind of nervous already. We're not halfway through the season. I think, are we going to do it? We're going to do it. And that win. They're nervous already. Um, and you know, with City, you know, City going to come back at them. You, you know that. But if the, bigger, the bigger they can make the gap, the harder it's, it's going to be, you know. So, you know, fingers crossed, you know, Liverpool can do it this year. You know what? I, I, I think Liverpool, European nights, you can't beat them. I really, really do. Um, I think they're special. Um, and I think it's quite iconic about that, having a European game at Anfield, all the flags. I think it's amazing. I think the atmosphere depends on the team, doesn't it? You know, I think when we look at Old Trafford, because it's so vast now and so corporate, you know, it's not the atmosphere that you do get at Liverpool. You know, I love the Liverpool people, that's why I live in the Wirral. You know, um, you know, the working class pit people, they come and support the team, they know football, they back their players. You know, but one thing about the two teams, you never really see them boo their players off or very rarely, you know what I mean? Or, you know, I've been at a lot of clubs and I've experienced a lot of uh, fans that when they want a player off, they kind of shout, and when he comes off, they clap, let's get rid of him. Don't, you don't see that at Liverpool, I think they're understanding fans. Um, and so I make United fans. So I think they're different atmospheres in different ways. Um, but I think I like the way Liverpool look after their players, look after their own. Because that's why Liverpool is as a, as, as a city, they look after their own. And whether you come from Timbuktu or, you know, Mate United like I did, they still look after their own because you're one of them. Um, and that's what I like about them. They'll have to be the one who gets Mate United in the FA Cup at the Cup. 2-2, two, two. it's good on the last minute. So playing training, it'll have to be Steve McManaman. I, f I think he, he, he was, he, he, he was, he could run, he was like Forrest Gump. Honestly, he used to do running around the pitch and he used to like, I wasn't the greatest runner. Um, not because I couldn't run, but because I just didn't like, mentally I couldn't keep going round and round and round, it just destroyed me. But Macca was just like up the front and then he'd stop and wait for me and have a little chat and then he'd come back and lap me and lap me. And <laughs> he was unbelievable. Now, he scored a goal against Celtic, you know, I don't know if you remember it, when he ran from the halfway line and that parkhead and he, uh, it was amazing. He was a fantastic player, really was. His feet were quick, uh, lovely guy, great trainer, had a laugh, he was perfect. Good question, that. I think... Um, You've got to go for Giggsy, without a doubt. I think Giggsy was... Things I'd probably play Giggsy on the left and Mac on the right, so that's, that would be my two, two wingers. But I think when you talk about longevity of a player, and, you know, I saw Giggsy come on the scene when he was, like, 16, 17, um, and some of the things that he, he was doing, he, he was like... That's just like, it was something like you'd never seen before. It's like, you'd, you know... And he, he was just amazing, he really, really was. The way he used to beat players, he could get in behind, he could come short, he'd spin you off. Um, and to play for the amount of times that he played and the honours that he won in the, in, the, in the Premier League. And even when he had to kind of revert back into a central midfield role in his later days, he still had the brain to do that. But, I mean, I was fortunate to see him come on the scene and he, he was extra, extra special. You know, I think my probably most trip was my first game at home against Leicester. So I was the captain in the team, you know, so that, that was a great honour for me to captain the great Liverpool team. And um, in the Leicester game, so I scored in that and all, 1-1. Uh, well, so I think you always, your first game, you know, captaining the team and scoring, I think that was my, for Liverpool, that was probably the best moment for me. Robbie Fowler. I call him God, we all call him God. Because he was just, I mean, he was one of those, I think Andy Cole was more one of those folks in the box strikers. 
Uh, Robbie Fellow could score all types of goals. I remember goal we scored against Villa, our folly, just smash it in the top hand corner. Right foot, left foot, headers. I mean, just watching him in training was just an education to see. And he was so, so composed about his finishing. You know what I mean? I mean, he's got a hatchet against Arsenal in about four minutes, something like that. He was one of those players that when he was in front of goal, you turn back and walk to the halfway line. Because you knew he'd score, you just wait for the war. You know, that, that's, how he, that's how he was. Coley was more fox in the box, that type of stuff, but Bobby Fowler for me all day long. Yes, definitely. Why, 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 why would he not be? I, I, I know, it's funny though, because I know Liverpool fans, and I know because he grew up in Liverpool, and you know, for him to make that step to go over to Manchester, I know for them it seemed a bit of a betrayal, you know. Um, but I, I, I don't see it that way. I, I kind of feel that a player's career is really short, you know, and once you finish your career, who knows what you're going to do. We've seen it so many players who finish football, like, fall by the wayside and they get depressed and a lot they run out of money and all that type of stuff. So, you know, I feel as much as it's about playing football, you've still got to make a living before you can't make a living. Uh, fortunately, Michael's gone into punditry now, so he's not too bad. Um, so if he's got a chance to go to Manchester United, I don't think anyone else would turn that down. I, I don't think you can say, well, because my relationship with the Liverpool fans should stop me from going to one of the biggest clubs in the world. I know Liverpool fans will see it different because I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan, you know, I'm a footballer. And you know, when people say, do I support? I don't support anybody. I grew up as a West Ham boy, so that's my team I supported. But since I became a footballer, I've stopped being a fan. You know, so, and I think for, for, as a footballer, you go and play for the club that you think you want to play for. Same way I left into Milan, I wanted to go and play for Liverpool. Um, but what Michael's done for Liverpool, you know, he's always got to be put down as a legend. And you can't say that fact because he went to make United, he should lose that title. And that's my outlook on it. Dave Beckham. That, that's, not even, that's, that's, that's not even a question. That's not, you, you can't even answer me that. You can't even, David Beckham was the best crosser I've ever, ever seen. I don't care what anyone says. Listen, Trent's only still young. But when you talk about delivery, you talk about free kicks, you talk about... I used to watch David Beckham all the time. After every training session, he used to take an hour. Balls on the right, balls on the centre, balls on the left. And he used to do it every day. For mate and I had for England, um, he could beat people. He didn't have to beat people, Dave Beckham. He just whipped things round. And... It wasn't just the fact that he's quality, it was doing it at the pressure moments, you know what I mean, against Greece, you know what I mean, qualify, top man corner, last minute of the game. You know, he, he was a specialist. I've never seen anyone do what he does, and I don't think, and I've seen some players, I've played with Zola, played with Mancini, I mean, I've played with Roberto Carlos at Inter, he weren't too bad neither. Uh, so I've played with a lot of specials, Zidane, so I've seen a lot of special players, but for me, Beck's a, that does all of them.